Thank you, Mariah. Not Mariah. Okay, so welcome once again, and I am very pleased that we'll have today's session, which will be a presentation, conversation, uh, by Professor Tom Weissert, who teaches for us here at Fairleigh Dickinson, and as I'll be discussing in a few minutes, he teaches for uh, a number of other places and is a uh, person with a lot of balls in the air. Today's topic is going to be an examination of the Supreme Court, the New Jersey Supreme Court in this case, and its future directions in personnel and, and policy, the kinds of decisions it may be making in the future in light of uh, a uh, opportunity that the incoming governor, Christie, has to, to appoint uh, what looked to be uh, a significant number of new, of new justices to the uh, Supreme Court. Just to give you a preview, next week uh, at our same time in the same location, Professor Gabriel Sama, like Professor Weissert, also somebody who teaches with us, like Professor Weissert, a lawyer as well as a scholar. Professor Sama next week will be speaking to us about um, Islamic law and Sharia and uh, given any number of uh, topics in the news, uh, this should be a, a conversation of uh, great interest and highly pertinent to, uh, to both uh, the class, the lecture series, and I very much hope you will, you will turn out for that, uh, that conversation on um, Islamic, uh, Islam Islamic law in theory and practice. So let me begin today's uh, introduction by taking us through a few recent decades, and we're, uh, in, we're on, right now it's March 29th, 2010, and we're in a decade that is perhaps uh, just starting and, and still searching for its soul, for its identity. In the 1980s, many people pointed to uh, that era as being the supposed uh, uh, decade of the, the me generation, uh, somehow narcissistic or self-regarding decade. You don't have to agree with that, but uh, that was at least a popular uh, conception or buzz that would go around. I'm not sure what the 90s were. Some people said it was an era of some kind of prosperity. Uh, some said it was an era of uh, unprecedented, not unprecedented, but certainly of dramatic uh, changes and often um, often rises in the stock market. We all know how that turned out, at least in the 21st century. In the 2000s, our, uh, our, uh, our legacy, our, uh, the kind of tone that was set is uh, perhaps ambiguous. Some people pointed, obviously, to it being an era of terror, an era associated with new wars, an era when we began to, uh, again, uh, discover that globalization was not without its perils as well as opportunities. And to some degree, that takes us up to the 2010s. And uh, we're just beginning this era, but it's, it's not clear what will mark it and how we'd like to characterize it. I will nominate for you that one way we might start to think of this uh, decade, or at least one prominent uh, meme or uh, element of the, of the 2010s, is being busy, right? A lot of people are busy or think of themselves as being busy. Uh, whether it is, uh, none of my students do this, but whether it is students who uh, text in the middle of class to their uh, parents or uh, colleagues, whether it is students who take six, uh, six courses while holding down a 30-hour job, whether you are driving on the highway and look over to your, uh, the, your fellow drivers on either side of you who are in their vehicles shaving and uh, texting and composing uh, uh, sonnets and sometimes making five-course meals on their portable hibachis. Uh, people are very busy. People have a lot of things to do, and they often like to tell you about it, how busy they are. Well, in this busy decade, I think Tom Weissert stands out as somebody who really is busy. He's got a lot of things going on. And unlike many of the people in this busy decade, he doesn't necessarily tell you that, and he doesn't uh, necessarily give the impression that he is a very, very busy person. He's, in my experience, uh, incredibly uh, calm and collected. He carries himself with a tremendous uh, composure and uh, a sense of uh, real, real bearing. He is not somebody that you would identify as being uh, uh, harried or as being uh, nipped at by, by multiple uh, agendas and, uh, again, these multiple balls in the air. But he is very busy. He's got a lot of things going on. One of the things going on in his life is that he is both the uh, chief counsel and uh, chief of staff for, for Jay Weber, who serves in the New Jersey uh, Assembly, 
but is also the uh, state chairman of the New Jersey Republican Party with an incoming Republican governor. You might imagine that both uh, Mr. Weber and Mr. Weiser have plenty on their plates uh, in terms of both the uh, legal uh, policy and, uh, and political uh, stage that has been set and that will be unfolding in the months and years uh, to come. Uh, just as an aside, it's serendipitous but uh, terrific for this series that we have a speaker today who's both uh, has this law background and it serves as a chief counsel and this political background, this uh, this awareness and sensitivity to sensitivity to the needs of politics. So uh, that was great, uh, great uh, selection by whoever organized the series to bring Tom Weisert in here. Uh, Mr. Mr. Weisert, Professor Weisert also teaches uh, here at Fairleigh Dickinson, as I mentioned, and at Seton Hall. Um, and in all of his spare time, he writes op-eds, uh, law reviews, and law review articles, and uh, contributes as an associate and expert for public mind and for other uh, policy uh, discussions. So uh, I'm I'm kind of humbled just thinking about what, what he's doing, and uh, will will remind myself not to complain for at least the next 24 hours about what I have to do. Prior to this set of obligations, uh, Mr. Weiser received uh, Professor Weiser received his JD, his law degree from Seton Hall University. He received a master, uh, master's degree in political science, another outstanding choice at uh, Vanderbilt University, and prior to that, re received his, uh, his Bachelor of Arts from Fairfield, Fairfield University in Connecticut. So as I mentioned, Professor Weiser will be talking today about the New Jersey Supreme Court and its future directions, and given his background, given his current placement, uh, given his interests and expertise in the issue, I can think of no one that I'd rather have lead us in this conversation than Professor Tom Weiser. So please join me in welcoming him to the Politics and the Public Mind. Thank you, Professor Peabody, for that uh, too kind introduction. I want to thank all of you for coming out and, and braving the bad weather. Certainly appreciate it. Uh, I've been uh, associated with Fairleigh Dickinson for 14 years. When I see Ken Green there, I, I think fondly to my uh, responding to a newspaper advertisement for an adjunct instructor at FDU. Uh, I applied. Uh, I was invited for an interview, and I interviewed with Ken Green and Peter Woolley of the Public Mind Series in 1996. Uh, I skated by and they hired me, uh, and they've been stuck with me ever since. But my association, my 14-year association with FDU is an association I greatly value. Uh, I've maintained that association through the uh, relationship with uh, Professor and Chairman Peabody now. Uh, and uh, I thank you uh, for the association and uh, for the invitation today to speak in this public lecture series. Uh, sort of a disclaimer at the outset. Uh, after law school, I did clerk for one of the current Supreme Court justices, uh, Janie Lavecchia. You'll see her name uh, up later. So uh, at, when you clerk, you uh, respect the admonition. admonition. Uh, what you see here, what you say here, what you hear here stays here with regard to chambers. And I, of course, would always respect that. But those confidences aren't essential to what we're going to talk about today, because I want to just talk about initially some uh, background, so we're all on the same page. Right? The New Jersey Supreme Court right, has a number of constitutional qualifications for its membership, all right? The first is that there's one chief justice and six associate justices. Again, that's by constitution. So when we're talking about the New Jersey Supreme Court, we're talking about a seven member court, one chief and six associate justices. And that's by constitution, all right? We are also talking about a certain selection process by way of constitution, right? States have various ways of appointing uh, judges, including judges to the highest court. 
New Jersey is actually among a minority of states in having the gubernatorial appointment process as its process for appointing judges. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean the chief executive, the, the governor, nominates a justice for the Supreme Court, and then that nomination uh, goes to uh, the state senate. State Senate has 40 members, right? Uh, 40 member State Senate, and that gubernatorial nominee is subject to the advice and consent of that legislative body, the State Senate. So you have uh, two branches involved in that appointment process, the chief executive and one chamber of the legislature. Right? And again, that's by constitution. It's written into the state constitution. Right? What's a bit unique uh, about New Jersey is that it has an additional requirement for all judges, including New Jersey Supreme Court justices. And that is uh, a nominee has to have been a member of the New Jersey Bar for at least 10 years. Right? Uh, a law student passes through law school, graduates, has to take uh, a bar exam. Uh, I spoke to a student, in fact, today, who was preparing for the New Jersey and New York bar exams in July. Right? If that student passes the bar exam, then he or she uh, can be qualified to become a member of the New Jersey bar. Right? Until you've spent a decade as a member of the New Jersey bar, you are not qualified you are not qualified by constitution, by constitutional requirement. You're not qualified to sit on any court, superior court, appellate division, or New Jersey Supreme Court. All right? Uh, that's a rarity. That requirement is a rarity. All right? So seven-member court, gubernatorial appointment, advice and consent, and a member of the bar. All right? Now, if a person, if a justice is nominated, confirmed at the outset, that's not the end. Right? That justice is entitled to a seven year term. All right? So you have an initial seven year term, and then that person, if he or she is still on the court and wants to be renominated, that person would again have to be nominated by the governor at the time, subject again to the advice and consent of that 40 member state senate. So a justice has a two level uh, process. An initial appointment, seven year term, and then another renomination and reappointment. Right. By the way, uh, no justice who has sought reappointment has ever been denied reappointment by a governor uh, since the institution of the 1947 New Jersey State Constitution. Now, some justices have chosen not to pursue reappointment. For example, a few years ago, Justice Peter Venero uh, resigned from the court before he was eligible for reappointment, before those, his seven years on the court had expired. So there are instances in which a justice will resign from the court. But any justice who has pursued reappointment has, and has sought it has received it from the governor, subject to the advice and consent of the Senate. Now, if that justice gets through that second stage, right, renomination, reconfirmation, then he or she holds office during good behavior and has tenure 
until he or she hits an age ceiling. All right? There's an age cap written into the New Jersey Constitution. And that age is 70. All right? And then once a justice turns 70, if he or she is still on the court, he or she is forced into retirement due to age. All right. So it's not lifetime tenure. All right. This is tenure until the age of 70 and that age ceiling. Now, I just want you to think for a second about that, how that compares and contrasts with the federal process. All right. The New Jersey and the United States processes for selecting and appointing judges are similar in that you have the chief executives, either the president or the governor, nominating someone, and you have a Senate, either the United States Senate or the New Jersey Senate, confirming or not. That is, with the advice and consent of either the United States Senate or the state Senate. So, so the two processes are similar in that respect. What's different is that when federal judges are nominated and confirmed, that's it. They are granted lifetime tenure. That's why, for example, uh, Justice John Paul Stevens of the United States Supreme Court is still on the court at 89. Justice John Paul Stevens will turn 90 on April 20th, less than a month away. And Justice John Paul Stevens at 90, almost 90, is still on the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court, and has been since 1975. If Justice John Paul Stevens had secured an appointment to the New Jersey Supreme Court, he would have had to retire 20 years ago. All right. Big difference between the New Jersey court selection process and the uh, federal judicial selection process. By the way, in the early 90s, uh, there was a, a challenge that made it way, its way up to the United States Supreme Court as to whether that age restriction on state judges was constitutional or not. And the United States Supreme Court held, upheld that age discrimination as permissible discrimination. So uh, that, that 70, age of 70 ceiling on New Jersey Supreme Court uh, justices is a constitutional restriction under a United States uh, constitutional analysis. So those, those are differences and similarities between the federal and New Jersey systems. Another unusual wrinkle in the New Jersey system. There is an unwritten rule, a custom, a tradition that there will be a partisan balance on the New Jersey Supreme Court. Seven justices, right? And that unwritten rule, that custom, that norm, going back 60 years now, is that there will be no more than four of those seven justices from one of the major parties. The alignment is usually four and three. All right? Four Republicans, three Democrats, or four Democrats, three Republicans. Right. The way that it's worked in practice is that governors have respected that rule uniformly across those 60 years. Right. They are given latitude, the governors are given latitude, however, to flip that partisan balance in favor of their parties. So, for example, if, it's, if, it's a, uh, if a Democratic governor comes in and it's four Republican justices to three Democratic justices, in making those appointments, that Democratic governor does have some latitude to flip the partisan balance in his party's favor toward the Democrats, and vice versa. Right? But that partisan balance of essentially a 4-3 split between Democrats and Republicans, Republicans and Democrats, has been in place and respected for about 60 years. Again very different from the federal process, where there is no expectation, no custom of a partisan balance. All right. 
What about our current court? Right now, the partisan breakdown, according to that unwritten rule, breaks down this way. There are four Democrats, Chief Justice Stuart Radner and Justices Long, Wallace, and Albin, and two Republicans, Justices Rivera Soto and Holmes, and one independent, Justice Janie Levecchia, for whom I clerked. Now, Justice Levecchia is nominally and technically an independent, an unaffiliated person. She, however, uh, worked extensively in the Republican administration of Christine Todd Whitman. So she is counted, effectively, as a Republican. So nominally it's 4-2-1, effectively it's counted as 4-3 Democrats to Republicans. Now, what about, uh, what about the decisions of the court? What about the policy making of the court? All right. Looked a bit about, at the structure and the personnel. All right. Whether you agree or disagree with the actions of the court, with the directions of the court, there is universal agreement represented here by a view of Professor Weffing. Uh, I referenced Professor Weffing. I was his uh, research assistant at Seton Hall Law, so I thought I'd give him a bow. But Professor Weffing's view is shared by uh, all court observers, or at least most court observers, is that since 1947, the New Jersey Supreme Court has been, and these are terms used by Professor Weffing, activist, independent, and liberal progressive. Whichever of those terms you prefer, you use those interchangeably. Right? An activist, independent, liberal, progressive court. For better or worse, right? this is to describe, not to, uh, not to dictate uh, a view of an outcome here. Okay. And Professor Weffing says, it is hard to find an area of the law in which the New Jersey Supreme Court has not been a leader in developing progressive positions. Again, for better or worse. For better or worse. How, how has this played out in some of these decisions? The jurisprudence of the court uh, could be the subject of many lectures. But I'll just give you a sampling here. Right. Two of the most controversial, two of the most controversial are what's called the Mount Laurel decisions and the Abbott decisions. Right. The Mount Laurel decisions are a series of cases starting in 1975 that have dealt with what housing policy, and more specifically affordable housing policy, will be in New Jersey and for New Jersey. The app decisions is a shorthand for a series of decisions, again, extending back decades now. Series of decisions dealing with school funding policy in New Jersey. These two decision areas are probably the most controversial uh, among the court's decisions. And they're probably the most controversial because they've had the largest policy-making effect uh, on state policy. Right? Uh, and it is these two body, bodies of decisions that have helped create that reputation of the New Jersey Supreme Court for activism, for progressivism, and for independence. All right. uh, very controversial in terms of policy because the Supreme Court has not simply, uh, not simply indicated whether something was constitutional or not, 
but has affirmatively uh, directed uh, that the legislature and the other policy-making bodies take action. All right. So in the Abbott decisions, for example, the court hasn't, has not just struck down three different school funding plans that the legislature has put forward over a series of decades. All right. But in interpreting the constitutional obligation to provide a thorough and efficient education. And that's the constitutional provision at issue in these Abbott decisions. That the state is under a requirement to provide a thorough and efficient education for students. In interpreting that clause of the state constitution, the court has done things like ordered preschool for three and four year olds in this, what's called the special needs districts even though the thorough and efficient uh, education clause of the Constitution speaks to a thorough and efficient education of students who are five to eight. It's actually in the state constitution that the state is obligated to provide a thorough and efficient education for students from the ages of five to eight, notwithstanding that age limitation in the Constitution itself, the Supreme Court has interpreted that provision as requiring preschool and state funding a preschool for three and four year olds in the Abbott districts. Again, that may be good policy, that may be bad policy, but it is certainly uh, an affirmative ordering by a court as to what policy, education policy will be. Right? Uh, a few years ago, the uh, New Jersey legislature passed a school bonding act $8.6 billion in, in bonding in order to build schools. That largely followed from a directive of the Supreme Court. Right? The school funding that's involved to the tune of billions of dollars is largely guided by Supreme Court decisions. Right? Very significant decisions, very controversial decisions with wide ranging effects for state policy and the other two branches, the legislature and the governor. Some other controversial decisions, and I'll move these, through these a little more quickly, uh, that have sort of proved radioactive uh, and controversial. Perhaps the correct outcome has been reached, but they certainly are controversial. New Jersey Democratic Party v. Sampson, 2002, uh, Robert Torricelli, sitting state senator, decided he would not run again. Uh, they were inside of the minimum number of days to switch candidates. The Supreme Court liberally construed uh, elections law to provide that Frank Lautenberg could uh, get on the ballot in place of Robert Torricelli. Uh, controversial. Uh, Dale v. Boy Scouts of America, uh, whether a uh, gay scout leader could uh, stay in the Boy Scouts or whether the uh, the association, First Amendment associational rights of the Boy Scouts trumped that. Uh, the New Jersey Supreme Court ruled in favor of the uh, Boy Scout leader. The United States Supreme Court reversed that and said the associational rights of the, United, of the Boy Scouts trumped the rights of the Scout leader. Prendy v. New Jersey was another decision that in the same term that was overruled by the United States Supreme Court, controversial, and others. Lewis v. Harris, Supreme Court determined that civil unions, well, determined that uh, gay couples are entitled to the same rights and privileges as heterosexual couples. That could take the form, said the court, of gay marriage. It could take the form of civil unions. All right. That was up to the legislature. The legislature decided on civil unions, although a motion's just been filed with the New Jersey Supreme Court saying that civil unions have not worked and uh, asking for a remedy from the court. So the court right now has, is again in the middle of the civil unions gay marriage issue. Right? Caballero v. Martinez, uh, whether uh, an, an illegal immigrant would be entitled to certain state benefits, Supreme Court said yes. Again, controversial. Some older cases, Right. 
couple of decades old, in Ray Quinlan. New Jersey Supreme Court was on the front lines of the quote unquote right to die issue. In the Ray Baby M, surrogacy and visitation. Surrogate mother wanted visitation of the child. Supreme Court said she was entitled to visitation. Again, right, on the front lines of this. Death penalty. Death penalties reinstituted by the legislature and the governor in 1982. New Jersey Supreme Court uh, overturned more than 20 different death penalty convictions. And there was never a, an execution in New Jersey from 1982 until the legislature and the governor abolished the death penalty in 2008. So you had more than two decades of the death penalty beyond the books, but no enforcement. In part, critics claim, because the New Jersey Supreme Court uh, overturned uh, those, um, some of those uh, punishments. Criminal law and procedure, another area of controversy. And finally, New Jersey Supreme Court has issued some controversial abortion decisions. The United States Supreme Court ruled that uh, even if women do have a right to choose under Roe v. Wade, uh, taxpayers were not obligated to fund uh, those abortions. The New Jersey Supreme Court disagreed and found that under the New Jersey Constitution, there is a limited entitlement to public funding for abortions that uh, implicate the life or health of the mother. Very different from the United States Supreme Court ruling. Parental notification. The New Jersey legislature and the governor signed a parental notification. That is, minors would have to seek the consent of one parent before uh, obtaining an abortion. The New Jersey Supreme Court overturned that parental notification requirement and declared it unconstitutional. Again, controversial. Right. I just want to point out one element here. I want you to marry for a second the idea, these two ideas, that there is a partisan balance on the court, 4-3 Democrat to Republican, 4-3 Republican to Democrat, with Professor Weffing's idea that, that the court has been, across all of these years, independent, liberal, progressive, and activist. So it's a bit confounding in that partisan difference, partisan balance has not necessarily resulted in ideological difference, or even necessarily a move toward the middle by the court. It has been a court from the very beginning balanced in terms of partisanship, but decidedly in one direction by ideology or philosophy. So if the partisan balance requirement was there to, to create a court in the middle, that goal has not been achieved. There may be other reasons for that uh, custom but it hasn't been a court of the middle across most of its history. What's ahead? What's ahead for the next four years? Right. Governor Christie took the oath of office on January 19th, a Republican governor after eight years of Democratic governors. Right. Now, just yesterday, Bob Ingle, who's a columnist for the Gannett newspapers, Asbury Park Press, Daily Record here in Morris County, some other Gannett papers, uh, as part of his column wrote, Governor Christie is suggesting changes to save the state from financial disaster. But the governor's greatest opportunity for new direction lies elsewhere. Christie has a chance to nominate or renominate four of the seven Supreme Court members, a majority of the court in the next four years. All right. So people like Bob Ingle see that as a significant opportunity for a change of direction. All right. So during the next four years you'll see, for example, Justice John Wallace. John Wallace is up for reappointment on May 20th. This May 20th, All right. he's a Democrat. All right. Even if the governor decides to renominate him, 
And if Justice Wallace is reconfirmed, two years later, he'll hit the age ceiling of 70. So Justice John Wallace's seat will become available either in a month or two or in two years. Either way, in 2010 or 2012, Governor Christie will have the ability to fill the Wallace seat. All right. Next year, 2011, Justice Rivera Soto, a Republican, will be up for reappointment right. at the end of his first seven years. Remember, you get your seven years, and then you've got to be renominated and reconfirmed. In 2011, Justice Rivera Soto hits that initial seven year period. And then 2012 and 2013, two more. Justice Virginia Long, a Democrat, she faces mandatory retirement at the age of 70. That's a Democrat seat. That, by the way, is a prime opportunity for the governor. That is a seat that he could make Republican as you swing it from a 4 3 Democratic court to a 4-3 Republican court. Justice Long, whom I know, she was there when I clerked, very nice person, uh, is also perhaps the most liberal member of the court. So her departure right, can have or could have an ideological difference on the court. Right? And Justice Helen Hones, a Republican, will, at, will be up for reappointment in 2013, the end of her first seven-year term. So, what does it look like? Governor Christie, over the next four years, has at least two, Wallace and Long, appointments, and as many as four appointments, depending upon what he does with Rivera Soto and Holmes. As few as two, right? at least two, as many as four over the next four years on a seven-member court majority of the court. Right? Now, what does candidate Christie say before he took office? Candidate Christie said the court is overreached and legislated from the bench. This is what he was thinking. Right? He also said there are no predeterminations on appointments. Right? His competitors in the Republican primary sought to push him to the right, by the way. Uh, candidate Lonigan and candidate Rick Merkt both said they would not reappoint any of the justices who came up. Canada Christie did not go that far. He did not say that he absolutely would not reappoint him. He said he would consider each individual. No predetermination on appointments. Right? Canada Christie said, I want someone who is extraordinarily bright, and I want someone who will interpret laws in the Constitution, not legislated from the bench. Right? His problem is that the Supreme Court in this state has seen itself as a superior branch of government, not a co-equal branch of government. They are not a superior branch of government. Again, Canada Christie's thoughts on the Supreme Court. The test, according to Canada Christie, will be applied to everybody. If you legislate from the bench, you will not be reappointed. If, in fact, you're re interpreting the Constitution and interpreting the statutes, then you have an opportunity to be reappointed. The furthest candidate Christie went in questioning a certain justice was with Rivera Soto. A couple of years ago, Justice Rivera Soto was actually censured by his colleagues on the court for an incident involving his son. A student, son played on a, a football team, another student headbutted his son, and uh, after that, uh, were a series of unfortunate circumstances uh, that led ultimately to uh, Justice Rivera Soto being censured by his colleagues. Uh, Canada Christie said, I have serious questions about Rivera Soto's judgment and temperament, uh, implying strongly that he would not renominate Rivera Soto. That doesn't necessarily help the composition of the court, however, because Rivera Soto is a Republican nominee, and he's known as a bit of a lone ranger. Where there are 6-1 decisions, Rivera Soto is probably the, the justice furthest to the right on the court. It's a Republican furthest to the right, and where you have solitary dissents, it's most likely to be Rivera Soto. All right. All right. Governor Christie's spokeswoman 
Uh, Governor Christie's not going to talk about the appointment process in public. He will make appointments based on the individual. Again, no legislation of the bench. Right. Now, the one thing I have seen from Governor Christie uh, since he's uh, become governor is this, that just appeared again in the Asbury Park yesterday. Under the current state constitution, no governor has ever failed to appoint a Supreme Court justice. Governor Christie appears ready to be the first. Christie said he was personally reviewing Justice Wallace. Again, Justice Wallace comes up for appointment on January 20th. And Governor Christie did not exactly express a ringing endorsement. This is what Governor Christie had to say yesterday. I did say during the campaign that I do not subscribe to the theory that people once appointed must be reappointed. I know that's the way it's been in this state, but I don't think we set up the Constitution with a method where the executive has to reappoint after seven years before tenure attaches just for fun. I think we did it because we want, because they want you to make an evaluation and a judgment. If we've learned anything over the course of the last year, it is that elections have consequences. Let me just take one minute to finish up with factors that are gonna, going to uh, enter into this. All right? The governor ha has as many as four different appointments to the court over the next four years. But he's not alone in this process. He doesn't have a monopoly over this process. Remember, there are checks and, uh, checks and balances. The state Senate's going to be involved in this. It's a bilateral interaction between the executive and the Senate. It's not a monopoly for the governor. Layered over that advice and consent of the Senate is the partisan makeup. Right? right now, you have 23 Democrats and 17 Republicans. You've got to get a majority of 21 to confirm someone. Right? Redistricting comes up in 2011 and a new composition of the state Senate is likely. But it may still be a Democratic majority in that Senate. Right? And that Senate, has, you have to get to 21, has to confirm a Christie nominee. There is that tradition unwritten rule, unwritten rule of party balance. It is difficult to pack a court with ideological uh, uh, compatriots if you have to maintain that partisan balance. If, if Governor Christie does not renominate Justice Wallace, it's still a Democrat seat. And he'd re be reappointing, or he'd be appointing a Democrat if Governor Christie is going to respect the tradition. Right? Representational factors. Uh, justice Wallace was the first justice from South Jersey in 50 years. He was sworn in by Stephen Sweeney, who's the majority leader, of the Senate president, powerful Senate president. And he's an African-American. Uh, he succeeded Justice James Colin, who was the uh, first African-American justice. Right? There are representational interests implicated by that and other uh, nominations. And finally, precedents and their inertia. Mount Laurel and Abbott and other decisions are precedents that have an inertia moving forward, that have a presumption in their favor. Now, I don't mean this to be Sisyphus, inevitably always rolling that boulder up the hill, always to come back down, but overturning precedence is a bit like pushing that boulder up the hill. You've got to stop its momentum, stop its inertia, stop its gravity pull coming down, reverse it and start pushing it up especially presidents that have been on the books for 30 or more years. Not easy. And centripetal forces on a collegial court. You can appoint new members, but it's a collegial court of seven members. And that has a way of pushing members together and to become like-minded. Doesn't stop Rivera Soto, Justice Rivera Soto, from dissenting, for example, but centripetal, centripetal forces, center-seeking, right, push justices toward the center, not out. I've taken enough time. I appreciate your attention. And uh, I suppose there's, there may be a few questions. Thank you, Tom. But I will take the first question from anyone who would like to ask it. Let me start over here. Okay. Um, Professor Weiser, would you believe that on, let's say, high salience issues, say abortion or currently health care, that the legislator will most look to the courts 
to sort of give them a nudge in the right direction because perhaps the issue is too high salience for them to deal with without facing backlash from constituents? Do you think yeah. they look more of, for the court to make sort of a little ruling for them to then back up and say, well, that's what we were looking at the whole time? Yeah, I mean, there is an argument that many legislators have not been disappointed that the court has uh, dominated in some ways the housing policy issues, the education funding issues, because uh, it takes those hot button issues uh, out of the legislative hands and, uh, and uh, puts responsibility with the court. So, uh, you know, again, there is there is that argument that uh, not all legislature, legislators are disappointed that those high salience controversial issues are dealt with by an unelected judiciary as opposed to finding uh, uh, or playing out in a legislative body. Uh, Governor Christie is open about being against gay marriage and seeing that he has possibly four appointments. How do you feel that will affect the, uh, the gay marriage trial coming back to the New Jersey Supreme Court? Chief executives rarely have litmus tests. You know, a, a president or a, uh, a governor uh, doesn't sit down with a nominee and say, are you going to vote the right way on Roe v. Wade? Are you going to vote the right way on gay marriage? Uh, they usually question a nominee about his or her philosophy, views of the role of the court, and those may be uh, surrogate issues for determining how someone might rule on that. You know, there is a motion right now before the New Jersey Supreme Court, uh, and even before just uh, Governor Christie gets to appoint anyone, the court may rule on that. It will be, it will be that issue of gay marriage will be an element of, uh, as long as that issue is out there and undecided, it will be an element of all nominees going forward for the next four years. Uh, yeah. What are the chances over the next however many years, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court stepping in and possibly taking action on these matters? To the extent these decisions are based on state constitutions, uh, then it's not a question of jurisdiction for the United States Supreme Court. You know, if, if for some reason it's a, new, a state Supreme Court rules on the basis of a United States Supreme Court right to privacy, for example, where you get a United States constitutional uh, provision at issue, then it, then it could put the ball in the court of the United States Supreme Court. Right now, I see it playing out uh, you know, almost completely in state legislatures, state Supreme Courts, 50, you know, across the 50 states. Uh, do you think tradition t should uh, dictate um, Christie's decision making when re-electing uh, past justices? Shouldn't you mean, we be allowed to review their bodies of work? The, the unwritten rule, you mean, of four and three? Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, there, are, there are arguments. I have heard both arguments that the 4 3, the partisan balance, is a good rule and should be respected. I've heard some argue that, well, it really hasn't re resulted in balance anyway. Uh, when, you, when you win an election, appointments are your prerogative. And if a governor, Democrat or Republican wants to appoint, wants to nominate uh, someone, regardless of party affiliation, he or should be able to. There's still the advice and consent role. It would still have to get by 21 senators. So, and that's how we do it at the federal level. So, you know, some people argue that the New Jersey process should move to the federal process and that unwritten rule of partisan balance should give way. Thank you. Um, you earlier were talking about uh, activist or liberal or progressive judges, and you said it was sort of an interchangeable thing. But couldn't you also have, say, a conservative activist judge oh, yeah. or um, you know, a conservative um, judge who legislates from the bench? Sure, sure. When I, when I was referring to terms being used interchangeably, I was specifically referring to liberal progressive, whichever of those you prefer. And Professor Peabody, better than I, can tell you about uh, you know, the difficulty of determining what liberalism and conservative exactly means in the judicial context, what exactly restraint and activism mean in the judicial context. And sure, there are plenty of people who argue that activism, whether of the left, liberal variety, or of the right, is troublesome. 
Um, so yeah, I didn't mean to imply that activism is only of the left necessarily. Uh, it can be in, in both directions. What we know on the New Jersey Supreme Court is that it has been in the direction uh, of the more liberal outcomes rather than conservative outcomes. Um, I think it seems like Christie got a mandate to make a lot of change like in the election, but um, do you think if he were to try to tackle the activism of the Supreme Court, which has been around for 60 plus years, do you think he's shooting too high? Like taking out the partisanship, just the, it seems like an institution almost if it's been that way for so long. Again, whether you, whether you like him or dislike him, I've not, I don't think we perceived Governor Christie as one, as a governor who shies away from a battle. Uh, he's in the process of, you know, uh, a budget battle with strong uh, interest groups. Uh, you know, you do have to be careful of, of uh, fighting multi-war battles. Uh, but, you know, the, the judiciary, it's an unelected judiciary and has no real natural constituency. So uh, there may, while there may be, uh, you know, Democratic legislators who seek to support the court uh, without a natural constituency of its own, uh, it's, it may be a, uh, taking on appointments to the court may be a less difficult fight than some others. Now actually changing Abbott policy or changing Mount Laurel policy, much more difficult much more difficult because you have real reliance interests there. You have state policy that's built up for 35 years with multiple billions of dollars invested in those. So changing justices is probably less difficult than changing those policies that have become somewhat institutionalized at this point. Christie campaigned a lot on lowering property taxes and Abbott and Mount Laurel are from what people cite as increased property taxes. Do you think he's going to go through the court to challenge these decisions or is he going to try and make a legislative attack on it? I think, you know, the governor has, has drawn, I'll back up, the governor proposed his budget a few weeks ago. Uh, shortly after that budget came out, uh, s uh, school funding numbers came out, uh, municipal aid numbers came out. And the decreased amounts of aid uh, implicated, again, these, the questions about Abbott funding and how our school funding should be distributed throughout the state. And the governor's gotten some support for that and some criticism, sometimes sharp criticism for that school funding. Uh, what I understand the governor to have said as a candidate is uh, watch what I do over four years. He hasn't hit 100 days in office yet. Uh, uh, so, I, I, you know, to the extent he takes on these, the questions of Abbott and Mount Laurel, uh, I think he has said it's, it may be, you're going to watch me over four years and then see where we are at the end of four years. It's the best, best answer I can give you.